Hello, this is Bill Connerly with the Economic Forecast as of April 6th, Monday, April 6th, 2020. Today, we are in uncertain times. I've started forecasting the economy back in when I was a young guy with dark hair, and the last few weeks have been the most challenging time of my career. But I think we're getting a better handle on the path for the economy, the timing is still a little uncertain, but the path looks a lot more likely uh, to be in place. So I'm going to begin with a talk about the recovery path. The um, path of the economy depends upon the health path for the country and the world. I'll talk about policy effects and I'll then address uh, some questions. And uh, I'll do the Q&A later. Uh, those of you who have wandered your cursor around the screen will see at the bottom a Q&A button and you can click that to type a question. There's a chat button that I will not be monitoring, but you can use that to chat with your other participants. That is not confidential, keep that in mind. And there's a raise your hand button that I'm gonna ignore, uh, but we will get to questions. And I think this will be fairly short. I'm uh, thinking my part will be 15 to 20 minutes. So let's talk now about the different possible recovery paths, or actually the uh, phase for the um, recovery. I'm going to describe this in three phases, the protect phase where we are now, reopen and normalize. And this concept of the phases comes from a really excellent paper published by the American Enterprise Institute. And uh, you can find it if you just do a Google search, AEI National coronavirus response. The paper is being widely quoted. And they talk about four phases. I'm going to omit their fourth, which is after we normalize, uh, they recommend that we develop resources for the next pandemic. Uh, that's a reasonable thing to do, but it's not part of this discussion. And I'm also using slightly different language. So in the uh, protect phase. That's where we are right now. Essential businesses only and work from home. You know what it's like. Our neighbors are homeschooling. I asked how homeschooling was going and I, they said uh, it was just like a regular school. Two students suspended for fighting and one teacher caught drinking on the job. <laughs> We're all getting used to it. Maybe a little bit of cabin fever, but some good humor here. It's happening uh, voluntarily as well as through government order. Uh, the epidemiologists, and now let me uh, caution you, you are hearing an explanation of what the, the doctors and epidemiologists are saying interpreted by an economist. However, uh, I've done a lot of mathematical modeling of different systems, demographics, as well as economics and business functions. And I understand the concept of uh, the modeling. And what all of their models are showing is a sharp upward turn followed by a downward turn. And in cases, hospitalization, need for ventilators and the like. Uh, the timing, and the severity will vary from place to place. There are some resources that can tell you what your state is up to, but it looks like the spike uh, in most places will be towards the end of April. Uh, Oregon, where I live, early May is likely, and then things will decline. But it's a little bit too soon to um, declare that everything is fine, because what we'll see is uh, in the reopen phase, we're gonna need lots of testing. And let me do one other housekeeping thing. Uh, for some of you, uh, you see my picture superimposed on the chart uh, I'm showing. That picture is in a separate box and you can drag it out of the way if you want, you can remove it uh, entirely. But for the, the second phase, which is recovery, we're gonna need lots of testing. So we may stay in this protect phase of working from home and essential businesses only after the caseload is down, but before we have enough uh, ability to test 
people with all the symptoms. But we will eventually get into a recovery phase, maybe July. I feel a lot more confident telling you what the economy will look like in this phase than knowing exactly when it's going to begin. But we will maintain some social distancing, distancing, uh, we'll open uh, non-essential businesses. And I think what that means is like restaurants will be open, but maybe they'll use tables in a checkerboard fashion so there's some space between one group of uh, diners and another group of diners. Businesses will think about their social distancing. Work from home will be more acceptable than it was before the pandemic. I think we'll see sports. I can't wait to see some soccer matches played, but I bet they'll be played in empty stadiums, but at least we'll uh, watch for them on television and there'll be some uh, travel. Uh, in order to get to the third phase, which is normalize, we need either a vaccine or treatment. The vaccine, they say, is uh, a year away at best. Uh, a treatment could happen quickly. Uh, there are some existing drugs being considered that might help, and maybe we'll find that. But when we do get into this, in this normalized phase, the, the final one, uh, there's going to be a conflict between cabin fever and new habits. <laughs> you know, I know that old habits are hard to break, but new habits, I think there'll be some of us who are a little hesitant to go out in crowds while others are going to want crowds. I want it both. I want to be in a crowd, but I want to be safe. I don't know how that's going to work out. So let's talk about the economic path in these uh, various phases. And I wanna, I'll be talking about the uh, uh, economic path as we currently are and in the uh, reopen phase and the normalized phase. Well, in the protect phase, you know where we are with massive layoffs. I don't have to tell you much uh, about that. Let me go back to the slides. And this is a picture um, that I have for uh, the economic outlook. Uh, it's best guess as to the timing, but I'm feeling more and more comfortable that I've got the concept right here. And if you have not seen this chart before, it's because you do not subscribe to the Bizonomics newsletter, and you can solve that problem uh, from home uh, without social contact uh, by uh, going to my website and um, by uh, The forecast is actually hand-drawn, you can see, and I think I can show you a cursor here. Uh, it's hand-drawn because it's not quite accurate, but I'm looking at uh, overall economic activity down something in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 percent, sharply down, uh, but then sharply uh, re rebounding. Let's do some um, zoom in on parts of this. Oh, incidentally, uh, the comment I made about 2018 and 2019 at the bottom, we did not know that 2000 and 2000, 2018 and 2019 were the good old days, but apparently they were. So this is the phase we're in now, the protect phase, with the economy going down sharply. Uh, I don't know how much worse it's going to be, but the economic statistics being reported in the paper are uh, lag. So we're going to get more bad news for sure, and then maybe the bad news is going to be close to over. And then this reopen phase, things come back quickly. That is something that not everybody agrees with, uh, but I think it's going to happen for two reasons. One, many people still have money in their pockets. They are working, they're working from home, they're in essential businesses. The majority of people, I believe, are still working. Plus you have the retirees on um, independent uh, income streams. And these people have been forced to save and now they've got more, they, or now, uh, when we get into the reopen phase, they'll have more money in their uh, bank account, they'll have some pent up needs, and they'll see very, very low interest rates. So I think that we're going to get a sharp rebound. There will be $2.1 trillion of uh, federal stimulus going in. I'll talk about that in more detail. I don't think we need that stimulus to get the rebound, but we've got the stimulus whether Bill Connerly thinks we need it or not. In the following phase, 
um, as we normalize, we get close to where the thin line on the chart, let me check the chart. Yep, you're seeing the right thing. Uh, the thin line on the chart is the old forecast, and I don't think we're going to get quite there. There'll still be some supply chain problems for a while, and I think there are going to be some uh, lingering concerns uh, that l keep people out of uh, some spending activities. Cruise ships may be kind of slow to rebook. Uh, and also, I think that there's going to be some challenges with the labor force. But that's the picture of the economic plan uh, that I think happening. And again, I'm pretty confident I've got the shape of the rebound, but I'm not so confident that I have the, um, uh, the timing right. Uh, that depends on the timing of the uh, uh, disease. So let me talk about policy. We've had monetary policy and uh, fiscal policy in uh, significant impacts. And I want to highlight here with another screen share one of the challenges being faced right now. Uh, we're seeing some weirdness in the uh, economy, especially mortgage rates are a good illustration of this. And uh, there we go. The uh, mortgage interest rate, this is the, the blue line, the upper line is the 30 year mortgage, the purple line, the lower line, very closely. Uh, for the 30 year mortgage, the 10 year treasury is a good benchmark. It's a different maturity, but because of uh, some principal is paid on a mortgage every month, plus their repayments, it ends up that the average maturity of a 30 year mortgage is in the ballpark of a 10 year treasury bond. And that spread between the two is pretty consistent at like 1.7 uh, percentage points. Up a little bit, down a little bit, but usually pretty close to that. But look at the area that I've circled, a very wide spread. Treasury bonds went way down and the um, interest rate on mortgages hardly changed at all. This is something that the Federal Reserve can handle, and I think that this is what we're going to see. Uh, let me, oh, there we advance in monetary policy. So the Fed is doing two things. They are stabilizing illiquid markets, and some of the mortgage uh, securities markets, uh, which are so important for real estate, uh, are, uh, were subject to uh, a lot of illiquidity. Nobody wanted to buy or sell, uh, so it was very hard to do a trade. And the fact is that the Fed can help that illiquidity problem. The Fed can step in and buy assets, debt primarily, and uh, help provide a market so that other people can buy and sell, and that is very reassuring to the market. What the Federal Reserve cannot do is solve a problem of poor underlying credit. So stock market fell. Well, not only is the Fed not supposed to be investing in stocks, they can do bonds, but not stocks. But the stock market decline that we saw in the last month is actually justified. Corporate profits will be lower, no doubt about that. Their ability to pay dividends will be lower. And with lower earnings, lower dividend payments, stock prices really should be lower. How much lower? Well, that's hard to figure out. And the stock market was obviously skittish about that. The thing that the Federal Reserve cannot help is assets with fundamentally poor credit quality. So let's go back to bonds and let's talk about the mortgages that are on commercial properties. So the, they are not guaranteed by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac as most residential mortgages are, but they, uh, those mortgages depend upon the landlords collecting rent, rent from stores and restaurants. And if the landlord cannot collect rents because the businesses have closed, then the landlord may not be able to make mortgage payments and that causes a, a real challenge. So that will be a lingering problem that the Fed cannot uh, solve, but at least they can 
calm the markets when they go a little bit too uh, jittery. Now let's talk about uh, the fiscal policy side. And this is a picture of federal spending. What we've seen over the last 15 years, gradual increase, and then 2020 with $2.1 trillion of spending. And I'll show you the list, but I'm not gonna go through all of the things that they're doing. Oh, um, this chart did not get corrected. Uh, it says 1.2 trillion, should say 2.1 trillion, but what's a trillion dollars among friends? I love being an economist and being able to round to the nearest trillion. So my wife says, Bill, is the checkbook balance? And I said, yeah, to the nearest trillion. We've got zero. Uh, so this policy, I believe, is not actually needed, but I think that we, oh, I was going to uh, share my screen here. Let's do that uh, to show you all of the uh, different things that are going on um, in terms of that, uh, that money. Uh, and um, so the $2.1 trillion does not help us in the current phase, the protect phase. Uh, it will help the people who receive the money without a doubt, uh, but uh, may, basically it does not get the economy going, does not get spending increased, production increased, employment increased. It will help in the reopen phase without a doubt, uh, and in the normalized phase, though I'm not sure that it's needed. And it may also cause some perverse incentives. I have over the years had occasion to do uh, a good bit of research on unemployment insurance. I had a, a nonprofit uh, paying me uh, to do that for quite a while. And what I learned is that obviously many people when they lose a job are very diligent. Other people, uh, well, most people find that job hunting is no fun, don't like to do it and the unemployment insurance enables them to be a little bit less diligent. So somebody who's unemployed, we've got massive economic uh, research behind this. Somebody who's unemployed uh, does some activity, Monday morning makes a number of job applications, and then what does that person do Monday afternoon? Wait to hear back on the other jobs or keep working as hard as possible at finding a new job. The, the more generous the unemployment insurance is and the more people uh, do some activity and then wait to see what happens and that slows down the entire process. And that was a factor in the slow recovery in past years. Let me go back to that uh, screen that we, uh, that um, uh, chart we showed earlier with the overall picture, and this will be the um, uh, uh, summary. Uh, we're going to have a sharp downturn, a sharp recovery, some subpar level. And let me then talk now talk about some of the challenges we're going to have in the next phase. After we are recovered, I believe we're going to have a rise in inflation. Now, the Federal Reserve wanted to increase inflation uh, over the last few years, but they have been unable to do so. Um, they uh, pushed and brought unemployment down. All of their econometric models said, we are going to get more inflation, but we never did. Inflation is classically defined as too many dollars chasing too few goods. Well, we've got the dollars in the economy, both from monetary policy and from fiscal uh, policy, a lot of dollars in the economy. And in terms of too few goods, I believe that we'll have some production challenges when we are in the recovery phase. And with a lot of dollars chasing a little bit fewer goods and services than we had before this, I believe we're going to have an inflation. We'll also have to accommodate the higher deficit, and I believe that we'll see interest rates going up. So don't get worried right now. For 2020, we're not having inflation and we're not having higher interest rates. Even in 2021, first half for sure, we won't have this problem, but sometime 
maybe 2022 or 2023, I believe we're going to have uh, more inflation and we'll have a different set of challenges. But I think it's reasonable to um, wait for that. So that's the summary. Let me give you the contact information and you're welcome to, oh, here's the contact information. All right, I'm clicking and it's not happening. There we go. Um, so feel free to uh, shoot me an email after this is over. Uh, you can also visit my website and sign up for the uh, newsletter. And at this point, let's see the, um, let's see if I can uh, get some questions and answers. My old friend, Charlie, one of the first people I chatted with when I moved to uh, Oregon says, what are your thoughts on durable goods purchases once we get to recovery and normalize uh, states, such as automobiles? Are we going to go back to the way people used to look at cars, or will, be the, will there be some significant changes in consumer interest? I guess this applies to all types of purchases. Um, thanks for the question, uh, Charlie, and uh, let me begin with cars, and then we'll uh, address other issues as well. I think people still want cars. One of the changes that will be lasting is we've had this great experiment in work from home. And uh, how is that going to change people's attitudes towards working at home? Uh, well, I know some people who are loving it, and I know some people who are hating it. So I think we're going to have a, a variety of experiences, but going in, working from the office will not be the norm. Uh, so I think maybe commuter times are going to be a little bit less um, uh, hectic. And I think maybe the interest in cars will be a little less, but I, I believe people will want cars for recreational purposes uh, going on. Uh, it may also change what we see in the It may also change what we see in um, uh, home purchases. Uh, it's nice to have an extra room if you're going to be working from home. Uh, so a young uh, couple sharing a one-bedroom apartment may find it kind of challenging to find a quiet space to work from home, desk space, and the like. Uh, so it won't work for everybody. But I think that maybe when we had... Um, when people have an option to buy a house, they'll be thinking, oh, maybe an extra bedroom, a study, an office would be good to have. I've gotten a number of questions ahead of time about real estate. Let me say a few words about that. Uh, right now, there are not many transactions going on. Oh, and incidentally, if you haven't figured out how to ask a question, mouse over to the bottom of your screen uh, to the Q&A button. Click that and you'll be able to uh, type in a, um, uh, a, a question. So back to the, the real estate, uh, there are not many trends. We certainly know that houses are not being shown uh, and that's a combination of sellers not wanting strangers in their house and buyers not wanting to go out and meet with people, plus there are legal restrictions in some states and uh, municipalities. So that is going to be slow. Once we get into the reopen phase, though, I think that there's going to be a good bit of interest in uh, buying houses. Uh, mortgage rates, I think, will be uh, very low, and people will come out of the woodwork. Any other questions? Uh, we've got a minute or two. Uh, be happy to uh, do that. While we're waiting, let me uh, share that um, uh, contact uh, scheme, uh, uh, screen again. And here's an interesting question on the um, stock market. Uh, when would you start buying stocks again? It's a good question. Um, Friday would probably, close of market on Friday would probably have been a good time based on what's happening today, Monday, April 6th, with the market rising very uh, rapidly. Uh, the Connerly family uh, pretty much stayed fully uh, invested. Uh, I don't know when the market's going to rebound. And the fact is, it's hard for anybody to know when the market is going to rebound. So uh, calm your nerves, try not to panic. And um, if you're 
uh, it's a time to, to think not short term, but rather long term. What's a good asset allocation for somebody in my position and uh, work through uh, that approach and go back to the fundamentals. We have another question from uh, my good friend, Ron. What about commercial real estate? Seems like demand will be soft long-term. Well, we had already been in a transition from um, a lot of retail. You know, retail has been soft. Uh, local grocery stores are doing okay, and a number of retail properties have been uh, converted into activity spaces, whether it's a yoga studio, a children's gymnasium, a uh, ceramic studio. Uh, so we're seeing that. But I think that um, people dialed up buying from online, both from Amazon and other, act, other vendors. And I think that will continue. So I think this accelerates the downward push on retail. The other interesting thing is what it means for office space. Now I said work from home is probably going to be uh, more popular, but one of the things that has reduced demand for office space in recent years has been the shift towards open offices. So when I began my career, people were two or three pe people to an office. And uh, when I got my own office, I was so, uh, so happy. Um, and uh, then the, they went to cubicles. And now it's like one big room, one big bolt in with uh, 50 programmers or customer service people there. Um, I've been concerned about that for a long time, both in terms of productivity with people breaking their concentration. And I dug up uh, some evidence that people in open offices take more sick days. Yeah, well, no surprise there. So I think we may see a shift away from open offices and that will increase the need for office space, maybe, maybe in the ballpark of offsetting the increased uh, work from home. Um, so let's, oh, an industrial space I think ought to be fine. Janet, uh, good to hear from you. Do you think this experience will impact savings rates? Well, right now, savings rates are through the roof because you uh, can't spend. It's a good question on a long run trend. We've been seeing over the past decade, I think, uh, a upward trend in savings rates, which offsets some of the long-term long trend towards lower savings rates. And I've been thinking that savings rates will rise somewhat uh, because the millennials watched the experience. They were maybe getting out of school about the time of the 2008-2009 recession. Uh, and they uh, had difficulties themselves and they watched their families have difficulties. So I think the millennial generation, aside from student debt, will be more cautious, try to save more, have less debt. And this may very, this pandemic may very well accelerate the idea that uh, people need a bigger savings account. On the other hand, we also have some evidence that uh, the stronger the uh, government safety net, the less people save. So uh, there have been studies uh, by great economists saying, oh, Social Security tended to reduce savings. Uh, uh, unemployment insurance tends to reduce savings. And this big bailout may be a saying to people, uh, the next time stuff hits the fan, there'll be another uh, bailout. Uh, Rob, uh, good to hear from you. When long rates begin to rise, will they rise fairly rapidly or more slowly? When do you think that will start again? When I forecast, I usually have a gradual path, but what happens is nothing has happened and then it suddenly changes. So my best estimate now is that uh, we're going to see higher interest rates, but they will just sort of click along at the low levels until traders suddenly say, ah, we're gonna have inflation and we need to get more compensation for the um, loss of purchasing power over the course of the bond. So, so not gradual is the historical experience, but I'm not sure of the timing. I think we're at least a year away from that. 
Janet again, so what impact will it have on higher education demand? I think demand for higher education will continue to be there. There are still payoffs to education. Uh, the method of uh, delivering higher education certainly changing. And uh, Zoom and the other platforms uh, will revolutionize it. Um, let me just say a few words. A, uh, a boring professor can be even more boring with visual aids. Uh, the challenge is the good professor who really gets people thinking, not just listening to a lecture, but gets people thinking, uh, that professor needs to learn new tools. But uh, these platforms like uh, Zoom and uh, the GoToMeeting, LogMeIn, they have uh, capabilities to put people in small groups, get some discussion going in the context of a large student lecture, and they actually offer, I think, more options and uh, better tools for getting students really challenged. You know, the best education is not just sitting and listening to a lecture, but it's thinking, being challenged. One student says, well, that means this, and another student says, no, it doesn't mean that. Uh, and I think that it's time for universities to rethink how they deliver. Uh, the lecture was uh, perfected in what? 1200, 1100 uh, AD in uh, Bologna, uh, and uh, professors are, are not doing it much differently uh, these days. Those are the ends of the questions, and we're at uh, the bottom of the hour. I'm going to leave it there. I want to thank you all for, let me share that screen as I close, but oh, 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 oh. I've got one more thing that you really need to hear, so don't bail out quite yet. America has faced a number of challenges over the decades. And those challenges have led to death, they've led to injury, they've led to frustration, they've led to poverty, they've led to unemployment, but we've overcome those challenges. I believe we're going to overcome this challenge. And at some point in the near future, we will find that we are back in physical health and we are back in economic health, and I think there's a good chance we'll be back in spiritual health, and that's your economic forecast.